I'd like to welcome you all. And as dean of HDS, it's my privilege and pleasure to be here on the, at this podium tonight to offer you this welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Professorship, which is to be presented tonight by the first incumbent of our chair, uh, our colleague and friend at HDS, Dan McCannon. The creation of the Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association Professorship of Divinity was announced on May 25, 2003, the 203rd anniversary of the birth of Ralph Waldo Emerson. That announcement marked the culmination of a two decades effort on the part of the Divinity School and the Unitarian Universalist Association to establish a permanent professorial position in the broad area of liberal religious thought and practice. And several people seated here on both sides of me tonight know well about that, uh, about that process uh, and the, the great desire that was there on both sides to bring this about. Uh, the endowment that made this uh, chair possible was the result of several gifts, including donations from the Unitarian Universalist so Association itself, from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock on Long Island, formerly, of course, the North Shore Unitarian Universalist Society, from the Liberal Religious Charitable Society and other individuals and organizations, and finally, two capstone gifts uh, from W. Lowell Steinbrenner, and Mr. Steinbrenner is here with us tonight. Uh, he's also an MTS 87, which is something we take pride in, and his wife, Janice, uh, and this gift uh, went along with, a, with an, a matching gift from the late Reverend Dr. J. Frank Schulman, STB 54, who is known, I'm sure, was known to many of you here, and from him and from his wife, Alice. Alice cannot be with us tonight, and I'm very sorry for that, um, but we will certainly see to it that she has a recording of it and that uh, she's able to be with us in spirit, just as we hope to do for Janice as well. The Emerson, we thank you all, uh, all of you that I've just mentioned for making this occasion possible. Now, the Emerson professorship stems from a relationship between HDS and Unitarians that dates to the early days of this school's history. In fact, the address of dedication for Divinity Hall, our oldest building, in 1826 was presented by William Ellery Channing, who a few years earlier had become the acknowledged leader of what he called Unitarian Christianity. Much of the subsequent ferment of Unitarian culture and indeed the broader ferment of 19th century transcendentalist thought played out at this very school. Although HDS has always remained firmly non-denominational, it is recognized by the UUA as one of the three principal schools that provide theological training to Unitarian Universalists who are preparing for ministry. And we're extremely proud of that. Naming the professorship in part for Ralph Waldo Emerson honors an historic figure who had a significant influence on both the Unitarian tradition and Harvard Divinity School. A Unitarian minister himself from 1826 to 1832, Emerson, who was a Harvard College graduate who had pursued further studies at the university's at that time young graduate school of theology, did much to formulate the philosophy of transcendentalism, expressed most famously, as I'm sure most everyone here knows, uh, in his wonderful essay, Nature, um, 1836, and further in his Harvard Divinity School address of 1838. In the latter address, he called for a fresh religious inspiration. Quote, let me admonish you, first of all, to go alone to refuse the good models, even those which are sacred in the imagination of men, and, to, and dare to love God without mediator as well. To introduce our Emerson inaugural lecture, it is my great pleasure and honor now to introduce to you my newly emerited, I guess that's a word, in German it's very easy, emeritiert, uh, but our emeritus colleague, um, uh, the, uh, who is known to most of you as the doyen of the history of American, of American religion, David D. Hall, the Bartlett Research Professor here. David has taught at HDS since 1989 and was Bartlett Professor of New England Church History until last year when he became the Bartlett Research Professor uh, as he took uh, his retirement. 
He has written extensively on religion and society in 17th century New England and in England, and, in work, and done so in works such as The Faithful Shepherd, A History of the New England Ministry in the 17th Century, The Worlds of Wonder, Days of Judgment volume, Popular Religious Belief in Early New England, and Puritans in the New World, A Critical Anthology, to name only a few of his groundbreaking publications. In many ways, his greatest legacy lies not only, perhaps, or maybe not even primarily in his work, but in the generation of young scholars, both those that studied under him and those who learned from him, particularly about lived religion, uh, that have gone on and gone out into the world now with his inspiration to teach. Another deep interest of David's that I share at least a part of is his interest in the history of the book especially the history of literacy and reading in early America. He edited with Hugh Amory the colonial book in the Atlantic world, which is the first of a five-volume series of which he is the general editor. We may have lost his outstanding full-time presence in the classroom, and having taught with him, I can attest to the quality of that presence. But he remains a prolific writer and productive scholar, and continues to work on religion and culture in early America with particular attention to the lived religion that I just mentioned, a focus that, of course, is now largely associated with his name. It is always David that is cited as the example of the, of the, the exemplar of lived religion scholarship in American history now. He is currently working on the development of cultural criticism in mid-19th century America. So let me invite him, without further ado, to the podium to introduce our Emerson inaugural lecturer. David, it's all yours. I want to share with you, or I want to fashion, a slightly unusual introduction by looking backwards at the process of making an appointment to the Emerson chair. And I want to begin actually by acknowledging the presence here of Ann Browdy, who uh, served with me on that search committee along with uh, others. The search committee sought the counsel of some of you here, and no doubt in the best traditions of the UUA received the counsel of, of others. <laughs> The process, the search process was marked by what I came to think of as the contraries of the Divinity School as well as the contraries of the Unitarian Universalist tradition. And if you found yourself wondering why this search took so long, <laughs> took two years or more, the answer lies not in procrastination or indifference but in the challenge of responding to those contraries. One aspect of the search was clear from the start, clear because most of you told us emphatically, what you told us emphatically, clear because of the university-wide context within which the Harvard Divinity School goes about its business. The purpose of this search was to bring a first class scholar here, a scholar who took seriously the kinds of questions that have animated the Unitarian Universalist tradition, a scholar capable of taking a fresh look at those questions and of encouraging others to do the same, a productive scholar whose light would not be hid under the proverbial bushel. Such a person would serve both Unitarian Universalism, as well as the Divinity School, honoring by his or her integrity the emphasis on learnedness that has always been characteristic of both school and denomination. But this certainty was accompanied with severe uncertainty. What fields of scholarship should we consider? At the outset was at the outset, the answer to this question was everything under the sun. And the result, as you might well imagine, was cacophony. Theologians, historians, historians of lots of different things, philosophers of religion, experts in ministry or practical theology, scholars of ethics, 
To name these is merely to hint at the varieties of people who applied. But as the search committee deliberated, and as certain candidates began to seem more promising, something of a focus emerged, a focus that would honor the central mission or identity of Unitarian Universalism, namely the concern with the ethics of everyday life and the ethics of a good society. And here, as many of you know, this faculty once included a remarkable teacher who embodied this concern. I refer, of course, to James Luther Adams. Then, of course, there was a denominational question. Some of you may remember in the 1950s, there were lots of jokes about how to make a dry martini. Maybe you don't remember that, but anyways, there were. <laughs> I'm going to check myself because I don't drink martinis. Or to say I got violently ill once drinking martinis, and that was, that, that was it. So the ultimate dry martini was this, fill a glass with gin, leave the room, and outside the room, whisper the word vermouth, and then re-enter the room. Now, something like that applies to raising the question of denominational affiliation at Harvard Divinity School in the process of a search. But as St. Paul so wisely said, there is the letter and there is the spirit. Could we find some way of acknowledging the spirit of the donors and something, as, something broader as well, the spirit of renewal within Unitarian Universalism. And finally, there was the ministry question. Those we classify as scholars can be interested or, frankly, not interested in ministry as it is practiced. Could this search find someone who manifestly was counted among the interested? From the start, virtually from day one, the search committee found a great deal to like in the Vita of Dan McCannon, that he was and is and will be a productive scholar was immediately evident from what he had already published and from what was underway. It was immediately apparent that his had been a distinguished academic record, beginning with the summa he earned here as an undergraduate at Harvard, extending through the ministry training he received at Vanderbilt and the PhD in the history of Christianity he earned at Chicago. And we had the great benefit of colleagues who had known him as an undergraduate, as Dean Graham just mentioned, but others as well, and also colleagues who had taught him and worked with him at Chicago, who were vocal, emphatic in their praise. Here, then, were elements of what the search committee was seeking. Academic excellence, training in ministry, and a passion certain to be made to known to all of you here this afternoon who have not yet encountered it, a passion for social ethics seen from the vantage of a historian. Dan McCannon commands a history of the Christian tradition and his first book, Identifying the Image of God, Radical Christians and Nonviolent Power in the Antebellum World, provided a fresh look at Unitarians and others as they dealt with, among others, the difficult question of slavery in the antebellum period. And it does so unusually from what I would call a theological perspective, not so common among historians. In subsequent books, Dan has treated, intentional, treated movements closer in time to the present, the history of intentional communities, and in particular, the history of the Catholic worker movement which in his most recent book exposes the contraries, to use a word with which I began, exposes the contraries of a movement hovering on institutionalization or restlessly engaged with movement and an institution. Now he is at work on a much broader history of religious radicalism in the United States with the working title of Prophetic Encounters, The Religious Left in American History, to be published by Beacon Press. Contraries is a good word, I think, to use in describing Dan McCannon. Not contradictions, but contraries in the sense of creative engagement with a broad spectrum of religious movements, contraries in the sense 
of acknowledging the complexities of Unitarian Universalism, always and everywhere, both a movement and an institution. Please join me in welcoming Dan McCannon as he gives his lecture, his inaugural lecture this evening on Unless a Seed Fails, Cultivating Liberal Institutions. Thank you so much, David. Uh, thank you, Bill. And thank you to all of the people uh, who have been working to make this evening possible long before I uh, certainly was even thinking about it. Um, your generosity is, is an inspiration. I've inherited a paradox. As the inaugural holder of the Ralph Waldo Emerson Unitarian Universalist Association chair, I'm accountable in some sense to a man who told graduates of this school to cast behind them all conformity to what they had learned at this school, <laughs> relying on themselves rather than on the institutions of historic Christianity. But I am also accountable to one of those institutions, indeed, to the denominational tradition that Emerson was leaving behind when he urged our students to acquaint themselves at first hand with deity. This sort of institutional accountability in a Harvard chair has few precedents. Among my colleagues, only Francis Schusler Fiorenza has the name of a denomination in his title. And while the Charles Chauncey Stillman Chair of Roman Catholic Studies may well contain its own paradoxes, <laughs> I am guessing that the Pope was not as intimately involved in its creation as Bill Sinkford was in the funding of the Emerson Chair. Thank you, Bill. Fortunately, I come prepared to deal with institutional paradox. Like Emerson, I have my anti-institutional streak. When I was 13, maybe my folks can remember this, uh, shortly after the election of Ronald Reagan, I decided the governments would work better if instead of making laws, they offered suggestions. <laughs> They could do the research to figure out what sorts of individual actions would contribute most to the common good and leave it up to each of us to act accordingly. Ten years later, I learned that this view has a name, anarchism. <laughs> and despite repeated backsliding, I remain more comfortable with it than with other political philosophies. And yet, I spent the past ten years teaching at two Benedictine colleges, local embodiments of the most enduring religious order in the largest religious institution the world has ever known. And now here I am at Harvard, a school that, as you all know, has lost more institutional wealth in the past year than any other university in history. Somehow, I haven't been able to shake free of institutions. In coming to the Divinity School, I have inherited a rich tradition of reflection on the paradoxical balance between spiritual freedom and institutional responsibility. For many years, Conrad Wright taught Unitarian and Universalist history here, and one of the great themes of his scholarship has been the role of institutions within religious liberalism. Wright worried, um, perhaps you still worry, that while Unitarian Universalists know the rebellious stories of Emerson and Thoreau, they do not know the stories of all the men and women who built congregational and denominational structures that would carry those rebellious stories forward. The canon of liberal saints, Wright has insisted, must include such men as Henry Bellows, Samuel Atkins Elliott, and Frederick May Elliott, denominational presidents who were patient and creative enough to keep both the Emersonian radicals and their antagonists within the Unitarian fold. My goal today is to build on this heritage by reflecting on the institutional ideas of a few religious liberals who are sometimes lumped a little too quickly with the anti-institutional Emersonians. Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, 
and Aidan Ballou were part of the rebellious second generation of Unitarians and Universalists, the same generation as Emerson. And they devoted their best energies not to congregations or the denomination, but to school, social reform societies, and experimental communities. John Haynes Holmes and Mary White Ovington were heirs of this tradition who lived two generations later, in the first decades of the 20th century. They were tireless in building up the new institutional structures of the settlement house and community church, as well as such enduring organizations as the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and the American Civil Liberties Union. I might add a great many additional names to this list if I had three hours instead of one. Theodore Parker, Lydia Mariah Child, Jenkins Lloyd-Jones, Clarence Skinner, Ethelred Brown, Charlotte Perkins Gilman. All these folks could say a hearty amen to every criticism Emerson lodged against conventional churches. But their real interest was in the shape of the new institutions they hoped would displace the old. In theological terms, all were invested in what might be called ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, though the church they envisioned was never easy for denominational leaders to recognize as such. They were practical as well as theoretical ecclesiologists, taking concrete steps to bring the new institutions into reality. Had they succeeded perfectly at this or failed utterly, there would not be much reason for me to give this talk. But their mix of success and failure makes them worthy conversation partners for us today. Before I flesh out what I see as the liberal ecclesiology of Peabody, Ballou, Holmes, and Ovington, I should say a few more words about Emerson. His consistent antipathy to institutions is revealed in the fact that he was almost as wary of his friends' new projects as he was of the traditional institutions of church and state. But the logic of his critique was not always consistent. In his essay on self-reliance, Emerson cast institutions both as dangerous menaces, society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members, and as ephemeral phenomena, phantoms, an institution is the length and shadow of one man. As is often the case, his criticism was more compelling when it was more personal. Reflecting on his friend's plan to build a new society at Brook Farm, Emerson confided to his journal that he, quote, wished to be convinced, to be thawed, to, made no, to be made nobly mad by the kindlings before my eye of a new dawn of human piety. He was cold because he was still struggling to put fully into practice his own individualist vision. I have not yet conquered my own house, he wrote. It irks and repents me. Shall I raise the siege of this hen coop and march baffled away to a pretended siege on Babylon? Emerson concluded that to join Brook Farm, quote, would be to traverse all my long trumpeted theory that one man is a counterpoise to a city. But his words make clear that the man he had in mind was no self-confident entrepreneur, but a repentant St. Anthony battling his own demons. Peabody, Ballou, Holmes, and Ovington would all learn eventually to be as repentant about their new institutions as Emerson was about his individuality. But just as Emerson began with an idealistic view of the individual, these others were motivated first by an institutional idealism. Despite the failings of existing churches and governments, they believed that institutions could provide the soil in which free individuals would grow up. Jesus himself, said Peabody, had pointed the way to a mode of organization which shall give freedom to the loving creative spirit in every person. The Constitution of the United States, likewise, was for her the greatest discovery in political science that the world had ever made because it tried to give institutional shape to the Christian principle that there is an infinite worth and depth in the individual soul. My four ecclesiologists were optimistic about institutions because they saw themselves as heirs to three previous institutional revolutions. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century had broken the overwhelming undemocratic power of the medieval union of church and state, opening at least the possibility of free religion. 
The American Revolution of 1776 had affirmed both individual rights and democratic governance in the political sphere and set the churches free to operate in their own sphere. And the Unitarian and Universalist movements, born as denominations in the first decades of the new century, had inaugurated a tradition of liberal religion that was slowly breaking free of the constraints of dogma and tradition. By 1840, when Peabody and Ballou began publishing their views on community, even the most recent of these three revolutions was one generation in the past. And it was easy to see the unfinished work that had been left in the wake of the previous revolutions. The American affirmation of universal human rights was denied in practice by the scandal of slavery. Women, African Americans, and Native Americans were excluded from democratic participation in the young nation. The light of democracy had not yet shone on economic institutions. And perhaps most significantly for our purposes, these reformers believed that the churches had not yet achieved their promised freedom. The separation of church and state had been a promising first step. Prior to that, Christians had had to choose between established churches beholden to monarchical power and small sects that claimed a spiritual, a spiritual superiority by setting themselves apart from their neighbors. But the emerging American alternative from the liberals' perspective was not a truly democratic religion. People weren't working together to shape a shared spiritual life. Instead, they were competing in a religious free market in which congregations thrived only to the extent that they could rouse a mass constituency through emotional appeals or else maintain the financial backing of wealthy pew holders and donors. In either case, religious concern focused narrowly on individual salvation. This state of affairs was unacceptable to my four interlocutors. Each, in his or her particular way, believed that it was possible to take the next step toward freedom and democracy in churches, in the state, and in the economy. Indeed, they believed that the new revolution would be most effective if it tackled church, state, and economy simultaneously. Now I turn to their particular ideas. Those of you who had the privilege to attend Megan Marshall's Conrad Wright lecture last week already know a little bit about Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. With her sisters Mary and Sophia and brothers-in-law Nathaniel Hawthorne and Horace Mann, she was part of one of the first families of transcendentalism. She launched her career as a reformer by serving as associate to Bronson Alcott at the Experimental Temple School. And both Alcott and other reformers valued her for her quirky intelligence and congenial spirit. Henry James didn't value her quite as much, but that's another story. By 1840, her bookstore was the primary gathering spot for Bostonians interested in new European philosophies. And she herself was particularly interested in the travails of young ministers who chafed at the narrowness and conventionality of parish life. When a cluster of those ministers resolved to form an experimental community that would, quote, permit a more simple and wholesome life than can be led amidst the pressure of our competitive institutions, she signed on, not as a member, but as a publicist. In two articles published in The Dial, Peabody laid out the social and religious vision that Brook Farmers were too busy or too humble to proclaim for themselves. The first article, entitled A Glimpse of Christ's Idea of Society, took on the ambitious task of identifying Jesus' true vision for church and society. Peabody set herself in nuanced opposition to the primitivist way of thinking then popular among American Protestants. The primitivist goal was to restore the true church from corruptions imposed over the centuries. And they assumed that Christ's institutional vision could be discerned simply by observing what his immediate followers said and did. Peabody sympathized with Shaker communities that had embraced communism on these grounds, but she was convinced that the primitivist starting point was fundamentally wrong. The apostolic church was no blueprint for the kingdom of God, and even the apostles themselves probably did not consider their churches anything more than initiatory 
So her corrective had two sides. The first was Emersonian. Jesus calls us not to mechanical imitation, but to intuitive self-reliance. Like every great soul, she wrote, Jesus remands us to our own souls. The other side of Peabody's corrective, though, was to call for a reconciliation of outward organization with the life of individual souls. Regarding social organization as neither indifferent nor a supreme object, Christians, according to Peabody, were called to create institutions that would cherish and assist in the perfection of souls. On these grounds, she was sharply critical of existing institutions. Before the judgment seat of Christ's sayings, how do our governments, our trades, our etiquettes, even our benevolent institutions and churches look? Anticipating the central theme of the social gospel movement, Peabody suggested that the problem could be corrected only by recognizing that Jesus made no distinction between church and state when he talked about the kingdom of heaven. He understood that simply as a just social order. And so she wrote, until not only every church, but every trade, every form of social intercourse, every institution, political or otherwise, is conducted on the basis of the golden rule, there will be no true church on earth. In her second article, Peabody explained how this ideal was being lived out on a small scale by the Brook Farmers. She singled out several aspects of the farm's constitution for praise. Each farmer was committed to sharing in all aspects of the community's work, and this practice would preserve social equality and express the great truth that all labor is sacred. By limiting the total hours of labor, the farmers would achieve leisure to live in all the faculties of the soul. Their refusal to impose any creedal boundaries on their community would safeguard their freedom to promote individual self-unfolding. The many ministers who are part of the company could, if they chose, work as pastors, but because they would be economically self-sufficient, they would be preserved from that virtual dependence on their congregations, which now corrupts the relationship. Most importantly, the community would devote its best energies to the work of education, so dear to Peabody's heart, affirming her principle that the highest work of man is to call forth man in his fellow and child. Peabody also shared a couple of salutary warnings uh, with the farmers, among them to avoid, quote, the mammon of unrighteousness in the form of endowment. <laughs> Another paradox for us to consider. <laughs> for the next six years, the Brook Farmers did indeed strive to usher in the kingdom of God on earth, creating a mostly harmonious society in which economic, political, and religious practices were radically democratized. In this, they were hardly alone. These were the years in which, according to Emerson, there was not a reading man but has a draft of a new community in his waistcoat pocket. Peabody's old colleague, Bronson Alcott, had his community at Fruitlands. Dozens of other groups embraced, with varying degrees of fidelity, the utopian blueprints of Charles Fourier, ideas that Brook Farm would espouse about halfway through its lifespan. Of all the communities that explicitly sought to balance cooperation with radical individuality, the most enduring was the colony of practical Christians established by Aidan Ballou at Hopedale, Massachusetts. Ballou represented a different strand of religious liberalism than did Peabody. A self-taught preacher, he had been called to the ministry through a series of paranormal visions. He migrated from the primitivist Christian connection to the Universalists, but soon he and his minister friends met congregational resistance to their strong preaching against slavery, war, and alcohol abuse. A change of affiliation to Unitarianism was of little help, and so the friends resolved, quote, to maintain ourselves financially outside of our profession by creating a cooperative community. Declaring themselves to be practical Christians, Ballou and his comrades believed that true Christianity had more to do with right practice than right belief. Disavowing all but the most general statement of Christian doctrine, the Hope Dalers were extravagantly specific in the moral demands they placed on themselves. Repudiating slavery, war, alcohol, licentiousness, oath-taking, corporal punishment, cruelty to animals, party spirit, covetousness, voting, and the lust of domination, they promised more affirmatively to, quote, 
Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, protect the helpless, comfort the afflicted, plead for the oppressed, seek the lost, lift up the fallen, rescue the ensnared, reclaim the wandering, reform the vicious, enlighten the benighted, instruct the young, admonish the wayward, rebuke the scornful, encourage the penitent, confirm the upright, and diffuse a universal charity. <laughs> the Catholic workers are a little confused because they think there are only seven corporal works of mercy. <laughs> Elizabeth Peabody was not unaware of the Hope Dealer's efforts, but neither was she wildly enthusiastic. Her Emersonian sensibilities were violated by the restriction of membership to those who take the temperance, abolition, non-resistance pledge, the pledge not to vote, etc. Describing herself as, quote, a temperance man, an abolitionist, a non-resistant, and one who does not at any rate vote, curious blend of gender-exclusive language and sly feminist wit, Peabody insisted that any membership test, whether creedal or behavioral, makes their community a church only and not the church of Christ's idea, world-embracing. Her criticism struck a chord with other reformers. Fourierist Albert Brisbane described Hopedale as a sect that could not act universally, while well, abolitionist Lydia Maria Child faulted them for fencing off an enclosure. These criticisms set off a prickly but ultimately illuminating response from Ballou. What exactly is a sect, he asked. After toying with a series of dictionary de definitions, he repudiated the usual understanding of sect as a small, intense organization with distinct religious beliefs and practices. Rather, he said, a sect was any group that put its own well-being ahead of universal righteousness. From this, from this perspective, it was possible to argue that mainstream churches that tolerated war and slavery were actually more sectarian than Hopedale, since they did so in order to maintain their social status. They are sectarians, wrote Ballou, who love their party better than they do true righteousness. We might well ask to what extent the great denominational leaders were themselves sectarian by this definition. The real antidote to sectarianism, Ballou was sure, could be found in utopian communities that only seemed to be sectarian. Brook Farm's strategy of excluding all established religious tests was plausible and captivating, he said, but ultimately delusory. In practice, people would only join such an association if they sympathized with the leading ideas of its leading members. Then what is such an association, he asked, but a sect? Hopedale had a better approach, striving to organize society on the basis of religious and moral test, which substitutes fundamental truth from fundamental error, essential righteousness for mere opinion and ceremonial, he's very against ceremonial, principle for expediency and freedom for bondage. Still, Ballou insisted that the Hopedalers bore no hostility to those who formed communities on other grounds. And so both Brook Farm and Hopedale moved forward, each applying its own understanding of Christ's idea to politics and economics as well as religious life. Both were, as Ballou predicted, relatively homogenous in ideology and thus avoided the explosive religious conflicts that racked some more inclusive Fourierist communities. They were, by virtually all reports except that of Peabody's brother-in-law, Nathaniel Hawthorne, good places to live. Both published journals that inspired far-flung sympathizers to embark on their own experimental reforms. But neither managed to catalyze the hoped-for transformation of society as a whole, and each eventually lost its will to carry on alone. Brook Farm disbanded when a fire destroyed its new community building, right in the middle of a vigorous debate about how far to go in embracing Fourierist principles. Hopedale succumbed to the logic of its mixed, mixed economic structure, which allowed two individual investors to gain a disproportionate share of the community's wealth and then pressure the others to abandon economic cooperation. Ironically, both Hopedale and Brook Farm were succeeded by liberal religious congregations. When Hopedale's joint stock company dissolved, it, a reorganized Hopedale community sponsored a church, a school, a library and lyceum, and relatively few Hopedalers left their homes. The other enterprises faded away, but the church itself has survived to the present. 
In Brooke Farms' case, the Unitarian minister William Henry Channing had begun offering voluntary services at the farm during its final months, and after the farm's demise, he and others organized a small congregation called the Religious Union of Associationists. Usually meeting in homes, the Religious Union sponsored talks on political and spiritual topics, pioneered interfaith dialogue, and invented a new sacrament that used bread, wine, and bread, water, and fruit to symbolize wisdom, love, and joy. Communities that had begun by criticizing traditional congregations wound up embracing the form of the congregation as the closest they could get to the kingdom. Elizabeth Peabody was first to anticipate this ironic turn of events. While the Hopedalers and Brook Farmers were planting potatoes and building schools, she was observing from a distance and reading up on a variety of historical analogs. In a series of seemingly unrelated articles, she took a giant step away from her earlier claim that the ideal church would be indistinguishable from society as a whole. Reflecting on a history of religion among the Dorian Greeks, she claimed that the Dorians had anticipated the principle of church and state separation by worshiping Apollo rather than Zeus, who as supreme creator was identified with the state. In a series of letters on American denominations written to a Polish friend, Peabody praised not the Unitarians, but the Baptists as the denomination most in harmony with American democracy and the genius of the gospel. The Baptist congregational polity and working class status freed them from the temptations of political power, while their fidelity to the right of immersion gave them spiritual vitality. The proudly local Baptist congregations, she said, shared a unity that was vegetative rather than architectural, and their influence on the larger culture was all the greater because it was almost invisible. Writing more directly about Brook Farm, Peabody renounced her belief that the traditional churches were to be lost like the morning star in the deeper glory of a kingdom of heaven on earth. She was now convinced that initiatory institutions will have an office as long as men are born children. As a select body of individuals committed to living by their ideals, the church was a necessary safeguard against the potential of even the best organization to become petrified. Let the Fourierists see to it, she warned, that there be freedom in their phalanx for churches. Whether she realized it or not, Peabody had by this means come around to Aidan Ballou's ecclesiology. The way to avoid sectarianism is not to tear down all the walls, but to make sure that one's own institutions live for the sake of society as a whole. Unfortunately, Peabody's new insight did not, at a stroke, correct the undemocratic character of church, state, and business in the United States. And so it should not surprise us that two generations later, another religious liberal would articulate an ecclesiology virtually indistinguishable from what Peabody had at first expressed in Christ's idea of society. This was John Haynes Holmes an heir of the transcendentalists whose grandfather had helped arrange the publication of the works of Theodore Parker, his pastor. Serving a New York City congregation from 1907 until his retirement many decades later, Holmes found himself near the vital center of the social gospel movement. Convinced that, quote, the affirmation of solidarity contrasted with individuality was the new spiritual truth of the age, Holmes worked tirelessly to reconcile this sociological insight with a liberal tradition of salvation by character. Taking a position to the left of mainline social gospelers, Holmes declared flatly that social salvation was the entire work of religion. The revolutionary function of the church, he declared in the optimistic years before the First World War, was to be the active agent rather than the passive witness of salvation. Calling for an indefinite extension of the field of religious activity, Holmes insisted, quote, there is not a question which the minister has not a right, nay, an obligation to discuss in his pulpit in the name simply of religion. Holmes' emerging vision of religion obviously had everything to do with institutions, but it set him in opposition to most of the stewards of the institutional church. Though Jesus, in Holmes' view, had been an agitator of revolution, the social significance of Jesus' teaching had been almost wholly lost by the third century. 
The churches were corrupted by individualism, otherworldliness, class divisions, and the denominationalism that diverted attention, quote, from the real evils of organized society to the unreal evils of theological error. One might think that that charge would not apply to the creedless Unitarians, but Holmes reserved his most scornful language for his own denomination. The one great united endeavor of the Unitarian churches, he wrote, is not the serving of society, but maintaining old Unitarian churches whose natural lives are already spent. <laughs> the situation in the churches was so dire, Holmes concluded, that the existing churches might need to die and be replaced by a new religion. When Holmes wrote those words, he was still the minister of a Unitarian congregation. His decisive break with denominationalism, and in particular with the great Unitarian institution builder Sam Elliott, came during World War I. An absolute pacifist, Holmes defiantly opposed the pro-war denominational resolution supported by Elliott and former U.S. President Taft, then serving as lay president of the Unitarian General Conference. Accused of treason by the denominational paper, but supported by his congregation, Holmes resigned his denominational fellowship, renamed his church the Community Church of New York, and ratcheted up the rhetoric. Denominational churches as organizations, he declared, are an intolerable interference with the program of modern life. Democratic faith required new churches for old. The path Holmes proposed to these new churches was as surprising as Elizabeth Peabody's endorsement of the Baptist polity. In hundreds of rural communities, declining Protestant congregations had consolidated to form non-denominational community churches. Though most of these were more theologically conservative than Holmes, perhaps more theologically conservative than Sam Elliott, he saw them as a splendid first step toward the new democratic religion of the future. The reason was that they imposed no doctrinal membership tests, but welcomed all members of the surrounding community. They are members of the church, wrote Holmes, for the same reason that they are members of the town meeting, because they are citizens. Such churches could thus fulfill Elizabeth Peabody's original vision of a church that was not an institution apart, but itself the community. This ideal of the community church allowed Holmes to sharpen his long-standing faith in the religious character of democracy itself. The exact antithesis of democratic religion, in Holmes' view, was Protestant denominationalism. His reasoning echoed Emerson's denunciation of corpse called Unitarianism, and even more so, Ballou's analysis of sectarianism. Denominational churches, Holmes charged, were trapped by the theological debates of past centuries and unable to tap into the main current of life. Thus cut off, a denomination tended, quote, to become an institution not of public service, but of private possession and interest. Holmes sympathized with the Unitarian effort to establish a more inclusive fellowship and with the efforts of Protestant ecumenists to lower the boundaries separating their denominations. But these efforts, he concluded, were fatally flawed because they assumed that existing church organizations were an indispensable starting point. Liberal ecumenists assumed that, quote, life cannot go on without the churches, when in fact, said Holmes, life is going on without the churches. A better reform would return not to the churches, but to society. Not the church is holy, he wrote, but humanity. A surprising implication of Holmes' vision for the community church was a new perspective on the separation of church and state. He praised this as one of the finest fruits of American democracy. But democracy's work was not yet complete. In the wake of World War I, wrote Holmes, democracy was radically transforming both church and state, stripping them of their tendency to serve private interests rather than the common good. Once church and state were fully democratized, they would not need to be separate, but both would be absorbed by the community, functioning as coordinate branches of a single fellowship. In building up the renamed Community Church of New York, as well as its sister congregation in Boston, Holmes hoped to bring to fruition the promise implicit in the rural community churches. Both congregations welcomed as members all who lived nearby, 
though not all chose to accept um, that welcoming offer. Both sponsored a range of programs and forums intended to engage the whole of life. Holmes also published New Churches for Old, just as Ballou had published Practical Christian Socialism, in the hope that others would take his vision and run with it. Much was achieved as a result. The Community Church of New York was a base of support for radical socialist and pacifist political movements through the Red Scares of the 1920s and the 1950s. It was one of the pioneers of racial integration within Unitarianism. But, as that point might suggest, it never ceased to be a denominational church. Far from being the first step in the disintegration of all existing churches, as Holmes had hoped, the community churches moved closer to the Unitarian and Universalist Center, becoming ever more fruitful contributors to the evolving project of Unitarian Universalism. As with Brook Farm and Hopedale, the community was, in the end, a congregation after all. And Holmes seemed to have made his peace with this, for in his autobiography he identified just two life regrets, that he had not spent enough time with his children and that he had not spent enough time with his congregation traveling around the country sharing his vision. All the while, he mused, there stands the home church, like the home base in baseball, which marks the score and keeps the game alive. In every generation, we come back to the congregation. Again and again, religious liberals have dreamed of a more inclusive, more democratic fellowship. And again and again, we return to this familiar form, so little different from the churches of our Orthodox brothers and sisters. How do we make sense of this? My own response, my own ecclesiology, takes its starting point from Jesus' instruction to his disciples in the days just before his crucifixion. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Read as a metaphorical prediction of a supernatural resurrection, this text has little appeal to religious liberals. But, along with the dozens of agricultural images that dot the Gospels, it can also be an invitation to see the correspondences between spiritual, or in this case, ecclesial experiences, and natural phenomena. Death and resurrection, on this view, are part of the deep structures of the universe, and they apply as much to our institutional dreams as to the seeds that we plant in our gardens. This way of thinking comforted Aidan Ballou as he contemplated Hopedale's failure to usher in the practical Christian republic. The Hopedale community, he believed, had to accept its death in order that it might, quote, have a glorious resurrection of which, of, of which its earlier manifestation was but the harbinger and prototype. Similarly, John Haynes Holmes' ally, Henry Jackson, in laying out his vision for the community church, wrote that such a church must be free to serve the community rather than itself, losing its life as an organization, if need be, for the sake of the cause. Like Ballou and Jackson, I've been captivated by the idea that failed institutions might hope for resurrection. My second book, Touching the World, dealt with a cluster of intentional community movements that hoped to transform society as a whole. And one of the things I wrestled with in that book was the fact that such communities do not always endure for long. Ultimately, I devoted a chapter to the idea that any community that hopes to change the world must be open to death and resurrection. The original version of that book, before it was shortened by my publisher, uh, dealt in part with Brook Farm and Hopedale, as well as the contemporary Camp Hill and Catholic Worker Networks. I'd like to read a little bit of what I wrote then reflecting on the way these communities may have resurrected the spirit of the early Christian church. The fate of the Jerusalem church, significantly, was not that different from the fate of Brook Farm and the other associations. Without clear rules that mandated sharing, the apostles' organization faded away almost as soon as it had begun, yet it was replaced by a spirit that has inspired new ventures in Christian community from St. Benedict to the present. Likewise, the spirit of Brook Farm and Hopedale may be alive today in Camp Hill and the Catholic Worker, and the spirit of those two movements may live on in sharing households and sustainable farms long after their names have passed from the lips of scholars, visitors, and friends. <laughs> 
It may be that the death of each movement as a distinct institutional reality is a necessary step on the path to a renewed society. That's what I thought in 2005. That reading, I now see, avoids the pesky fact that Hopedale created a congregation that did not die, that is still living today. More generally, my earlier interpretation didn't, ta didn't take Jesus' invitation to think in organic terms deeply enough. Birth, death, and new birth are not the only natural phenomena that might help us to understand the fate of our institutions. When a seed falls into the ground, more is involved in the question of whether it lives or dies. It falls into a soil community in which many things are already dying, being born, or in the middle of their life cycles. The seed encounters a soil structure already shaped by the roots of earlier plants, the tunnels carved by earthworms, the nutrients released by microorganisms, perhaps by the steel cut of a plow or the harsh poison of a pesticide. Even the manner in which a seed is dropped may increase the likelihood that it is choked by weeds or, at the other extreme, that it becomes a monoculture, itself choking out the biodiversity of the field in which it is planted. So if we are to think of our institutions as seeds, it's not enough to ask whether they will live or die. We need to think about all the complex ways in which they will interact with the other institutions that make up their environment. Will our congregation seek growth at any cost, or will they try to discern the right size for their particular mission? Will they define themselves in opposition to other congregations, or will they celebrate their neighbor's achievements as much as their own? If we must have congregations that are set apart from the larger community, can we still make the good of the whole community the purpose and the measure of our congregational health? Here there's much to be learned from the way the Hope Dalers participated in the abolitionist and peace movements, from the way the Community Church of New York lent its institutional prestige to the fledgling NAACP and ACLU, from the way Elizabeth Peabody made the micro-institution of her book bookstore into a resource for the mini-institution of Brook Farm. There's more to be learned from all those stories than I have time to tell. But I do have time to share a bit of insight from the work of John Haynes Holmes' ally, Mary White Ovington. Like Holmes, Ovington was a Unitarian heir of the abolitionists. She grew up with heroic stories of Frederick Douglass and the great group of men and women who had risked all for freedom. But it was only in her 40s that she began devoting her own life energies to the cause of racial justice. As executive secretary, board chair, and treasurer of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, she has been described by her biographer as the founder of the first and greatest American civil rights organization. Like Peabody, Ballou, and Holmes, Ovington dreamed of a new institution that would achieve the promise of American democracy. And yet, if Ovington was the founder of the NAACP, there is no truth in Emerson's claim that an institution is the length and shadow of one man. Not only was Ovington a woman, but her role, beautifully documented in Carolyn Wedden's biography, was not to impress her own personality on the institution, nor was it to crucify herself in the hopes of being resurrected. It was rather to put her gifts and her desires at the service of the organic whole. As an interracial organization committed to the full civil rights of African Americans, the NAACP faced three obstacles, any one of which might have destroyed it. The first was that northern whites, even the heirs of the abolitionists, did not know their African-American brothers and sisters. And so, as soon as Ovington felt the call to interracial work, she apprenticed herself to as many African-Americans as possible. Prominent businessmen, impoverished slum dwellers and the nurses who served them, revivalist preachers and socialist agitators, partisans of the conservative Booker T. Washington and the radical W.E.B. Du Bois. Ovington found these teachers to be unendingly kind, enriching her life even as they empowered her for the work ahead. The second obstacle, which became apparent as soon as her apprenticeship had begun, was the enormous power exercised by Booker T. Washington at the turn of the 20th century. 
Washington was a case study in good institutional stewardship gone terribly, terribly wrong. His approach, his approach to race relations, which emphasized industrial education rather than civil rights, had captured the imaginations of many white philanthropists. Washington, in, in turn, captured the loyalties of young black activists by demanding their absolute loyalty before he would give them the endorsement they would need to raise funds from these white philanthropists. As an admirer of W.E.B. Du Bois, Mary White Ovington was appalled by this situation. But she recognized the direct attack on Washington would achieve little for the young activists who were dependent on him. Instead, she used her own independence to slowly change the ecology linking black activists to white funders. When an idealistic young leader presented her with Washington's endorsement, she would pretend to be surprised and say, well, but I'm not a supporter of Washington. And immediately the mask would drop from the young man's face and they could begin to strategize together. When she heard an older activist give a radical speech at a northern event, and then a much more conservative speech when Washington was in the audience, she merely caught his eye after the speech, trusting that his awareness of her awareness would do its own work. Again and again, she called on her wealthy white friends to consider alternatives to Washington. The third obstacle facing the NAACP was the sheer ambition of those wealthy friends, and indeed the sheer ambition of the man she admired most, W.E.B. Du Bois. Several different men would have liked to make the NAACP the length and shadow of themselves. Ovington's task was to keep this from happening without sacrificing the particular gifts that each one of them brought to the organization. She did this mostly by a patient ministry of listening and translation. When Oswald Garrison Villard demanded that Du Bois' authority as journal editor be subordinated to his authority as chair, she took his concern seriously, acknowledged the merits of his criticisms, and held his feet to the fire. To you, it's just about Dr. Du Bois. But to me, it means a confession to the world that we cannot work with colored people unless they are our subordinates. And everyone who believes in segregation will become a little more firmly convinced that he is right. It's too bad that uh, Villard's grandfather, William Lloyd Garrison, did not have a similar helper in, in dealing with his own jealous relationship with Frederick Douglass. Ovington held Du Bois accountable as well. It may well be that she saved him through their ongoing correspondence in the end from the same sort of jealous megalomania that destroyed the legacy of Washington. Mary White Ovington, in short, was one person who planted herself in the rich soil of an organization, just as each one of us is planted in a congregation, a school, a neighborhood, just as I have been planted in the institutional paradox of the Emerson Chair. Ovington's special gift was to grow in a way that helped the other seeds planted in the NAACP also bear better fruit. And she did this in a spirit of adventure, not sacrifice. My life has been so happy, so full of pleasant happenings, she wrote in explaining her tolerance of Du Bois's obstinacy, that I feel singularly drawn toward people whose lives turn crisscross. In her individual practice, Ovington thus stands as a model for institutions that wish to live for the sake of society as a whole. Just as she lived in such a way as to help Villard and Du Bois become their better selves, so a liberal religious congregation can practice a hospitality that will not only make itself more diverse, but also help surrounding congregations become more welcoming. A liberal divinity school, too, can develop its own mission in ways that strengthen the missions of other schools. Even without dissolving into the community as a whole, an institution can live its way into a better environment. I haven't written a 500-page Practical Christian Socialism to spell out concretely how this might come about. I do hope that the Emerson Chair will help catalyze a more fruitful partnership between Harvard and the two Unitarian Universalist seminaries, as well as between Harvard and the Unitarian Universalist Association. This fall, we will host a national gathering of UU doctoral students, and I hope many of you will be able to join us for that event. For Unitarian Universalist congregations, one step toward a more 
ecological ecclesiology might be to developing, develop honoring rituals to be shared with other groups that do good work in our communities. We're often quick to advertise our differences with other religious communities. But what if we threw a party every time a Catholic parish opened up a homeless shelter or an evangelical church put up solar panels? Another step could be for congregations to keep as careful records of what they hope to see in their communities as they do of their own numerical growth. We know exactly how many more or fewer Unitarian Universalists there are this year than last. But do we know whether there are more or fewer children living below the poverty line in cities with UU congregations? What would happen if we took that number as seriously as the other in our institutional choice making? You get the idea. But I should give Emerson the last word. Reflecting on his friend's infatuation with the two elaborate theories of Charles Fourier, Emerson noted wryly that Fourier has skipped no fact but one, namely life. <laughs> For all his anti-institutional prejudices, Emerson knew intuitively what it took Peabody, Ballou, Holmes, and Ovington a lifetime to learn that no institutional scheme can fully control the bubbling creativity of life itself. At the same time, these others also learned what Emerson couldn't see, that our institutions are as vegetative, to use Peabody's phrase, as the, as the individuals who participate in them. Our congregations, our denominations, and our divinity school have been planted with many seeds. They have grown up not in the straight rows of our democratic dreams, but in the tangled thicket of life itself. Within this thicket, the grass grows, the buds burst, the meadow is spotted with fire and gold and the tint of flowers. In the refulgent summer of our institutions is a luxury to draw the breath of life. Thank you. I want to thank Dan for an inspiring lecture and one that I think deserves at least a couple of questions. We weren't going to have questions, but I really think they're probably, uh, as I have, questions that, uh, that, that should be put to him. So let's take five or ten minutes and then we will move on. So, Dan, go ahead if you would. Okay. I'll let you call. Go ahead, George. I noticed you pointedly talked about denominations instead of associations. Hmm. You act like a denomination, but yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the pieces that that these four folks didn't talk a lot about is congregational polity, you know, which is the other um, major portion of Conrad Wright's legacy here. Uh, and uh, I think that's part of what um, Peabody was getting at um, in talking about uh, the Baptist emphasis on congregational polity, that that being an association of congregations, valuing the individual particularities of each one you know, is an antidote to some of the dangers of denominationalism. Uh, uh, all four of these folks still, you know, did feel that Unitarians acted like a denomination, which is part of why I use that language throughout. Other questions? Tandeka? Um, oh, thank you. Again, that... Uh, we came back to congregational life again, yeah. not much different from our more orthodox brothers and sisters. Right. What was the difference? Oh, you're asking maybe there wasn't any difference at all. No, no. I'm asking you, since there were differences, what were they? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, I think, I think the precise differences would, would depend on the particular group of orthodox brothers and sisters one was comparing uh, oneself too. I think, uh, 
I think the distinctive feature of our congregational life shared to varying degrees in other traditions would be the perpetual dissatisfaction uh, with congregational life that, I, that I've been talking about. Oh, yes. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. And what can we create in a community um, that is intrinsic to the community and doesn't scale to the congregation or doesn't scale to the denomination? And we now have a number of fields in operations, research, et cetera, that really can deal with these questions of scaling and that it's not, it's not uh, to be assumed that what works for the farm works for the community. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. My colleague um, Don Swear and I and a couple others are going to be meeting with a number of colleagues from the business school um, to plan some events on the theme of sustainability, uh, which um, will be a great opportunity to uh, uh, to dig into um, multidisciplinary approaches to that. And I'm going to maybe. In, invest um, Don a little more than he might be willing to say, you know, it would be great uh, to be in conversation with you about that as well and bring, bring the psychological perspectives uh, in. I think one of the great challenges is that small communities of the sort that I've studied, you know, whether the ones I was talking about today are Catholic worker communities, uh, you know, are deeply committed to all the goods that can be achieved only on a very small scale. And they've done wonderful things on a very small scale. Uh, but they haven't thought very much about um, the ecological question that I was asking at the end. How does a community that thrives at a small scale do that in such a way as to be helpful rather than uh, unhelpful uh, to the large, you know, to the larger whole? Uh, um, if you figure out things in a really great way and live them out in a super righteous way that turns everybody else off, you really are a sect uh, in, in the terms that I've been talking about. Uh, Ballou thought about this uh, in his 500-page book, Practical Christian um, Socialism. He had a whole scheme about how to make it spread out more widely, but it wasn't an ecologically developed scheme. It was, it was worked out in his own head. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that there can be deeper thinking on precisely this question. Yeah, Dorothy. Mm. in as well. Um, her style of institutional leadership is really quite remarkable. Um, and it made me think of Friedman's uh, work on congregational dynamics uh, generation to generation. But I wonder if there's other models that go along with that that come to your mind, or how do you see that? How do you see that informing our current institutional life, or, or how might we apply <laughs> yeah, um, mostly I talked about Mary White Ovington because I want to be Mary White Ovington. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I've read people who are thinking along these lines, but it's not coming to mind immediately, so I'm going to have to save that one uh, for further pondering. Yeah, Jack. But I'm Jack Mendelson, and I've been for years now a foot, a foot soldier in the movement to bring a faculty membership to the Harvard Divinity 
by golly, you succeeded. <laughs> but I have an institutional question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why aren't you billed according to the what we presented with all of the fundraising for the Harlem Divinity School and a very careful description of how you were sought out? And by golly, they did a great job. But how come you are not called the Ralph Waldo Emerson? Not what not a student in lecture, <laughs> but a professor. But a professor of liberal religious studies. Why hasn't that happened? When you plant seeds, they always take a certain time to mature. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. And Jack, I think all in the fullness of time. You better believe we're planning for this. Uh, thank you again, Dan. And now I'd like to invite everyone to a reception at the other end of the building in the Brown Room. And uh, please come and join us and have a chance to chat with Dan uh, a little more quietly and personally. Thank you very much. <laughs>